right. Welcome, everyone. Episode five of Fraud Fact Friday. And some of you may have noticed that today is not Friday. It is Thursday. However, it is Friday somewhere in the world. For example, in New Zealand, it's it's Friday. So we're still kind of um, in our normal routine here. Um, but uh, I wanted to go live this week. And I've got Joe Stevenson here with me. Hi, Joe. How are you, David? I'm fine, thanks. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. Good. Thank you for having me here today. Now, thanks for coming on, uh, especially in this special edition, the Thursday edition of Fraud Fact Friday, at least for us, it's still Thursday. Um, the reason being, I'm traveling tomorrow, can't go live, um, but I uh, wanted to go live this week because it's International Fraud Awareness Week. I don't know if you've uh, heard of that, but... I, I have, but I didn't know who started it until I read your post this week. Okay. Yeah, me neither. So what I do is I do these, uh, I have these different social media calendars that with different hashtags and special days. And I stumbled across the International Fraud Awareness Week. It was on one of these calendars. But hey, that fits quite well. Uh, uh, very interesting to me next to, for example, on the 26th of this month is National Cake Day, of course. But I thought... International Fraud Awareness Week uh, would be a good one. They use the hashtag Fraud Week. Um, so yeah, we decided to go live today on a Thursday. Well, I'll um, come back for International Cake Week. If, as long as <laughs> All right, that sounds good. Um, so anyways, I uh, we met on LinkedIn, uh, of course, and uh, I saw on your profile that you mentioned three areas that you're passionate about, and it's fraud, social media, and online investigations. And you kind of hit the sweet spot with those three things in the fraud fighting community, do a lot of speaking in those areas. And um, I'd like to explore those areas here with you together today. And um, on the same note, if there's some time at the end, I'd like to hear some tips from you on how we can, uh, us nor normal users that aren't planning on being criminals, how we can keep our <laughs> data safe uh, in the age of oversharing and social media. Absolutely. Um, so you've been on a couple of episodes live, uh, and uh, so you know what's coming. The Fraud Fact Friday Fast Facts, I believe is what I called it. And um, yeah, so I'm going to ask you five either or questions, just as icebreakers, as people jump on and uh, join us. Um, and uh, you have to answer them within 30 seconds. And right. this time I have my 30 second clock, so we're going to try and uh, do the time right. Um, so are you up for it? Five questions, either or questions? Fire away. Okay. Here we go. Here's the 30 seconds. You see it? Got it. Amusement park or museum? Amusement no, park or a museum? Museum. Museum. Okay. Early bird or night owl? Night owl. Free coffee or free Wi-Fi? Free coffee. Pizza or burger? Pizza. If you could only use one Facebook or LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay, we made it. And that's not just the weird you're live on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, I know they, <laughs> they would have cut us otherwise, maybe. But um, yeah, okay. So you went with free coffee instead of free, free Wi-Fi. Coffee. If, I oh, mean, yeah. Wi-Fi is free pretty much everywhere these days. So I guess yeah, hotspot, cellular data. I'll take yeah. the coffee anyway. Okay. <laughs> Any uh, night owl? Night owl, definitely a night owl. Okay. I, so ten, I, but ten a.m. wasn't too early for you. Uh, ten a.m. was not too early for okay. me. No, Good. that's that, that fits my schedule perfectly. Thanks, David. All right. Good. So I'm going to let you officially introduce yourself now and talk about how you got involved in the fraud fighting space and what you're currently doing. Sure. So it's uh, it, it's I think at least here in the U.S. it follows some, uh, somewhat of a traditional pattern. So I was a police officer uh, for almost seventeen years. And then during that time frame, I uh, started working in the latter years as an accident reconstructionist and working closer with the insurance uh, industry mm -hmm. and started consulting with them. And then that kind of transitioned into learning more about uh, SIUs and the fraud, uh, which never was really part of my knowledge base until I really started working hand in hand with adjusters on, you know, accidents. And then that transitioned into me being offered a job with an insurance company in their SIU. Mm -hmm. And then from that SIU director. And then as you know, you grow and you expand, um, 
kind of how I fell into this niche of social media and online investigations was primarily out of need. Um, so I found myself, you know, working from home, handling claims nationally, uh, and you didn't have the ability to run down to your local courthouse or over to, um, you know, somebody's house to do an interview. You had to figure out ways to collect and find information, um, you know, over the internet. And it just, it provided such a great means to do that. And then that's great. There's information there, but how do I find it now? And how do I not spend six days trying to find one piece of information? So mm -hmm. it was always a progression. How do I okay. speed this process up? How do I find more information in a quicker time? How do I use that to either validate a claim or raise more questions about it? Mm -hmm. And then what's the point of having all this knowledge if you don't share it? Right. So for me, it's always been, you've got to share this information out there. It's, it's not that whole, uh, you know, knowledge is power thing that I think some people experience in their careers with, with uh, you know, people in higher positions. It's about sharing the data. Um, getting information out there so that people know how to do this and they can, you know, stop the fraud. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and that, uh, that transitioned right into the job with Intertel. Uh, you know, got a call last January out of the blue asking if I was interested in talking to them about uh, a new position they were starting. And it just fell into this perfect al alignment, we'll say. Mm -hmm. um, they are very much about education over sales. Um, making sure that we're getting the message out there, sharing that. So I'm still speaking a lot, both to the insurance and law enforcement communities, and it's it's been fabulous. Okay, great. Thanks for uh, sharing that background. <laughs> I I uh, am not being a very good host to our guests that are joining us live. I'm supposed to greet them as well. Um, so <laughs> hello to anyone who's watching. Um, I noticed the first question already came in. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to let that just jump right in. I probably will. Um, but anyways, if you're viewing, I'd also like some feedback on this. I got a new mic. So if somebody says, oh, it sounds pretty good or there's some crackling. So if anybody's got feedback on the tone, that'd be nice too. Um, or where you're viewing from. Where are you, Joe? Forgot to ask. Uh, I, I'm in Maine. Okay. So the northeastern United States. Oh, we're not that far apart. Just a huge ocean. So yeah, well, I'm in it's a small Germany pond. and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, not bad. A couple um, of time zones. <laughs> um, so uh, as you were doing your introduction, a question came in. We can push it back or you can address it now. How can you trust information from the internet? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a fabulous question. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you can't trust information from the internet. Okay. Uh, and, and that's... I think probably one of the biggest things I try to talk about in my classes is validation. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that you see, whether it's an image or a video, they're just pixels. They're just colors on a canvas. They mean absolutely nothing unless you can make some uh, connections to that and show that it's factual. So statements on a post on Facebook, uh, a video on TikTok is nothing more than just you know, a, a painting. Uh, and until you relate it, until you can show why that's important or why it's relevant and validate it through the sources, you can't trust anything. Okay. So, great question. All right. Um, Thanks, it's, Stanley, it's, for that. Yeah, it's more work to actually validate something than it is to find something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I saw that you do a lot of work with different organizations. You were previously president of the New England chapter of the International Association of Special Investigation Units. I think Correct. you guys say Iazu, is that right? Uh, Iazu. 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 Okay, good one. Um, it's definitely shorter than the official title. <laughs> so what, um, what were some experiences you have there? I mean, it helps you kind of stay up on the, on the fraud trends, right? What are, you, what are you seeing there, being involved with these organizations? Yeah, I think uh, IASU and IADI, which is the International Auto Theft Investigators Association, are two that I am primarily involved in. Mm -hmm. um, though I've, I've spoken at CFE and AFA and, and the others. Um, but with those organizations, and I think this is critical to anybody who is in the fraud fighting community who wants to do well in their job, who wants to make an impact, being involved in these, in these organizations is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. when, I, when you and I say network, a lot of people think social network. Mm -hmm. But networking is in person. Um, is so vital to what we do and understanding the trends that are happening. 
uh, you get kind of fixated into your own line of business or the, your own fraud that you work, uh, and you don't understand how much uh, certain patterns follow all frauds. And then new techniques that are developing in, let's say, an auto theft that you might not see, you know, materialize in, you know, some type of online ID theft or vice versa. Um, but as you get exposed to that through these organizations, uh, it, it allows you to grow this bigger picture. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the network itself, um, being able to speak to people. I, I've learned more at dinners and sitting at board meetings than I have sitting in classes sometimes um, yeah. because of that deeper in, uh, conversation that you get with people. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've heard you now talk a little bit about the human element, personal interaction a lot lately. Um, coming to, back to our topic of social media, uh, social media intelligence gathering. So this is probably not a phrase that was that common maybe five years ago, or eight years ago, say. Um, but maybe you can talk about with this in the background uh, how the fraud investigators role um, and tool set has changed over the past several years. Sure. I think, um, you know, it, it's just that constant uh you know transition as technology develops we need to develop so um you, you see that shift from you know even outside siu investigators who you might have had teams of people going out and working a small regional area you know driving out doing interviews now you see less of those people and you see more people sitting in an office um you know uh, SIU analysts have exploded over the last few years, uh, mm -hmm. and and it's that need to have that uh, diversity in investigations. I know mm -hmm. people who are, are incredible at interviews with somebody. Yeah. Sit them mm -hmm. down, make the person cry, uh, you know, find the truth, you know, it, just excellent. But are unable to locate anything online. Um, just because it's it's outside of their their comfort zone, mm -hmm. where you have other people who couldn't really do an interview and would struggle with it, but give them a computer and it's amazing. Yeah. And I think as technology develops, you know, one of the big things are mobile devices. So that's an area where I think at least insurers in the U.S. are slowly starting to embrace and incorporate into their investigative structure. But for me, it's one that's the witness that's waiting to be asked questions, and we forget about it. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't give preservation letters out to people when we're doing interviews or the onset of claims to say, don't ruin, don't destroy, don't delete any digital data on your phones. Um, everybody has a phone. Everybody carries it with them. And technology is constantly tracking what you do. Yeah. So that phone is is vital to how we do things. Mm -hmm. um, so another uh, question came here. Uh, from Stanley, uh, how much how much uh, time of your investigations then do you spend online? Uh, that is an excellent question. Again, <laughs> uh, is that two for two for Stanley? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's on fire today. <laughs> yes, uh, it really depends on for me what I'm researching, uh, okay. and and then it depends on the company and the investigator. Time is always going to be the predominant factor in anything that you do, particularly mm -hmm. investigations. How much time am I going to allow uh, to do this? And I think you have to set those boundaries for yourself, whether mm -hmm. that's two hours or four hours, whether that's 30 minutes or an hour, you're going to know. And once you get really good at it, like I know after about 30 minutes, whether or not I'm going to find something. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also spent two hours on Facebook alone trying to find something because I thought it was just around the corner. Okay. And, and that was two hours worth of wasted time. So okay. learn yourself, learn your own capabilities. Um, and, and then you're just going to have to find that sweet spot for yourself. Okay. Um, so again, on the topic of social media, um, hashtags are growing in importance across all the channels and they're becoming more and more creative. And I saw that you post uh, on to the hashtag data lies everywhere. So what's right. the story behind that? I heard a little bit uh, now previously, but what's the full story behind that hashtag? 
Uh, that's just, again, it goes with this whole theme of there is data in everything that we look at. Mm -hmm. So whether it's your phone, your computer, uh, your Fitbit that's on your wrist, um, you know, whatever's going on, your Wi-Fi system, we are so uh, connected with technology today mm -hmm. that data is everywhere. Data lies everywhere. And it's kind of an awakening call just to say, listen, uh, you may not have thought about this, but start thinking outside the box. Data goes has to go between two things. So there's always something receiving it and always something sending it. So we get fixated sometimes on just one device. Mm -hmm. um, but my phone and my computer are talking to each other, but they're also going through a Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So there's three systems there that potentially have that data. So whether you're talking about a fire in a house, what devices re were recovered, where did that data go? Does it have to go to a third party somewhere that's also collecting it? So it's just trying to bring awareness to the idea that you may lose a physical piece of evidence, but the digital information, that data lies everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a matter of you just tracking it down. So um, each and every one of us now, I've, uh, as myself, I am uh, very active on social media. We all have our own um, digital footprint. Yeah? Correct. And um, so at a high level, I mean, if you Google the, the term investigator, uh, you still uh, get, if you, if you look at the images, it's uh, something like, like this guy up here. He comes up with his... Uh, with his uh, magnifying glass and he's looking at a footprint or usually something analog. It's not really, hasn't really hit the, the trend that he's looking at a digital device. Um, the traditional right. images are looking at the physical type of things. Um, how do you investigate then this digital footprint? Well, I, I think uh, we have to get away from the idea, um, you know, uh, and I'll always kind of revert back to the U.S. Um, just because that's my base. But, you know, for years as investigators, we wanted somebody's social security number to validate their identity. Yeah. Um, to me, those are useless now. Okay. Uh, I want his email address. I mm -hmm. want their username. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the things that are predominantly going to get me somewhere. Um, facial recognition. You know, there's a reason that Facebook and Instagram can immediately tag your photo once you upload it. And mm -hmm. it's because they're, you know, they're cataloging everybody's, you know, facial features. And and that technology is here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's going to get better. I, I think uh, reverse image searching, whether that's through Google or like TinEye or one of these others, um, is really vital to what you do. And again, that goes back to the data lying everywhere. Um, yeah. Hashtag. It's, yeah. it's thinking, how do I find somebody? How do I research them based on the general information I have? Um, mm. And then I would say on top of that, I think we're bad internally about thinking about where we're getting data. We always want somebody to give us the data and then we're going to work off of that. Um, but like insurance companies, everybody's got an online portal. Uh, they all have the ability to uh, log into and find their insurance um, information. So pull their policies, follow a claim. Well, they've created that username and password. Mm -hmm. um, and the investigator should be reaching out to like underwriting and saying, hey, what username did they use? What email address did they use to sign up? Those are other sources of information that we have to start relying on as well. Okay. Um, this might be a bit of a sidestep, but I think it has a little bit to do with the digital footprint. I saw on uh, LinkedIn that you presented on the topic, shining a light on the deep dark web um, yes. at the SCFIA conference. Um, so at a high level, what are you presenting there and what were your main takeaways there? So really it was the idea of demystifying the dark web, mm -hmm. uh, getting people to understand that it's not this, it, it's, it takes a little bit to get there. You have to have a different type of browser. You're not going to go on Google Chrome or Internet Explorer and get there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just because that those browsers aren't built to go to a .onion website. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's just all part of the Internet. Okay. Uh, it's 
it's, it's a matter of going there. And when people talk about it being full of deviant behavior and, and terrible websites of people selling humans and drugs, um, that's there. Yeah. Uh, but it's much more than that. It's, it, it goes to the idea of, you know, people in oppressed countries, um, people whose human rights are getting, you know, uh, squashed by, you know, a, a state, uh, being able to communicate, you know, the Arab Spring uprising, mm. you know, generating on the dark web. Um, BBC's on the dark web. Facebook's on the dark web. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's much more than that. And because that is true, there's also information on the dark web that people you may are, not be going to. Right. Yeah, you know, people are leaving their forums. footprint over there. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So basically using it as a, as a tool in the, in the tool set then. Correct. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's funny. Like I found a hacker website that allowed you to run people's email addresses and see if they were breached mm -hmm. and the amount of information that they were kicking back on the different breaches, though it was kind of surface cause they wanted you to pay to get more information. But on mm -hmm. the surface, it gave you a really good idea of whether or not somebody's identity potentially had been stolen. Okay. And then you could work from there. So mm -hmm. little bits of information kind of laying everywhere for you yeah. to grab. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, uh, this whole uh, you've been Facebooked thing, uh, <laughs> talk about that a little bit. Uh, people getting caught because of their... Uh, Facebook posts, I guess. Correct. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think we're seeing a transition on Facebook. I think, uh, the popularity of Facebook is, is starting to wean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Instagram is coming up, but still it's, it's images and, and, and videos, right? So that's where we get people. TikTok is very geared toward the tween and teens, yeah. uh, with their videos. But how many times do you see a parent behind them doing yeah. something silly or yeah. them putting a video up of somebody slipping and falling. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be the person, the person in the background could be the person that you're actually investigating. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, to ignore certain sites. Um, but uh, yeah, Facebook is, uh, is an interesting place for sure. Okay. And with the privacy changes and everything else, um, you know, it, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter's making a, you know, coming back pretty strong. So mm -hmm. you kind of have to follow the shift in, uh, in popularity every day. Yeah. Okay. Um, closing out the episode, I wanted to talk about, um, yeah, the role of social media in today's society. And maybe you have some tips for people on how to keep their data safe. Of course, we don't want to tip off the fraudsters and make them smarter, but, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe some some high level tips. Um, is it even possible to have your data be safe on social media? Uh, yeah, you you can never post anything and have zero. Delete accounts. all your accounts, and then, yeah, <laughs> and, and then you'll be better off than than most of us. But you can't control what other people. If your spouse is putting photographs of you up there on Facebook, Facebook is still going to catalog your face. They're still going to know who you are. They yeah. can still you know, tag you or, or make that correlation. So um, unless you can control everybody in the world uh, and make sure nobody puts anything up on you, uh, it's going to be really difficult. But yeah. there are certain things. Um, for me, it's know your network. Mm -hmm. Know your network and know your platform. So I like LinkedIn professionally. I will try to connect with as many people um, that I believe I have something in common with that they can either learn off of me or I can learn off of them. And I will build that network pretty indiscriminately mm -hmm. um, versus Facebook. I've gotten rid of, I used to have like close to 600 people on Facebook. I'm down to uh, well under a hundred and 90% of those are relatives. Okay. I'm not going to put information up on Facebook about me personally. Mm. You know, it's, it, I don't use it that much anymore, but it's really to stay connected with my relatives. Um, so when I do put something up, I know, that the people who are seeing that, I know and trust. It's mm -hmm. not just some random friend of a random friend who decided to connect with me. And yeah. I think that's where we get lost. Um, I remember yeah. my daughters being really excited when they both got 100 likes on an Instagram post. Yeah. You know, And then it was this push to add more followers and more followers. 
and not knowing who these people were and then putting pictures up. Oh, I'm on vacation. Well, mm. that also means that your house is empty and somebody can go break in. Yeah. So yeah. knowing your network and who you're communicating to is, is important. And then like behind me, uh, this white wall, knowing what's in the image that you're putting up as well. You know, don't take a picture standing out front of your garage with all your tools and then have your wife post that you're on vacation so that somebody can go, oh, there's this tool and that tool. You know, you're you're adding to the ability and, and criminals are smart. And I think that sometimes we forget that some are very stupid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but some of them are extremely brilliant. And yeah. any image that you put out that has details in the background tells a lot about yourself. And I, I like some, your teddy bear. I got some good good reading material <laughs> back here. Uh, yeah, some good plants. But uh, yeah. I like to garden, so people might know that a little bit now. Um, so I got a question here before we uh, uh, end the session. I hope that's okay. I don't know Absolutely. if you're under any time pressure. Um, from Kristen, thank you for the question. Do you uh, recommend everyone freeze their credit? That's a good question, Christian. Uh, if Christ you, Kristen, oh, sorry, Kristen, Kristen? Kirshane. Kir Kir okay. Sorry, I'm. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I do. I, I freeze my credits. Uh, it's very simple. Depending on the the provider that you most go to, it's usually a one click unfreeze. Set the time frame for it to be unfrozen by 24 hours or 48 hours, and then they freeze it right back up. So okay. it's an easy process to do mm -hmm. uh, and it makes it impossible or not impossible. It makes it very difficult for somebody to, you know, um, get into your credit or start new accounts under your name without you knowing about it. So yeah. yes, highly recommend it. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, I apologize again for uh, the pronunciation of uh, the last name, but uh, I will work on it. Uh, if, uh, hey, we can call. Maybe you want to come on the show as well, Kristen. Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And um, Joe, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think we can thank wrap you, up the episode. Uh, I try to keep them always between, you know, 25, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, oh, my goodness. Last minute question from Stanley. I have to give it to you. You got, a, you got another minute. I <laughs> He's got to be... Trick. <laughs> yeah, he's got the hat RPM. trick. So uh, any guidelines for accepting, I might be able to weigh in on this one, but uh, any guidelines for accepting LinkedIn invites from people you don't know? So I do typically, and I have seen this, where you get somebody that has an indiscriminate profile picture or none whatsoever. You jump over their profile and it's a name with some you know, generalized title, no company information, no other details on it. I do not accept those. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm looking to validate the person. And sometimes yeah. I get something from somebody who is completely out of my network. Uh, mm. And then you look through their, their bio and you realize this person is, is maybe not doing the same profession, but is interested in this. It might be an advocate for this. Uh, so I'm going to accept that person, but yeah, yeah, you, you, you need to look at the bio and you need to make a decision on whether or not this is a real person or not. Uh, what I like to, then, yeah, oh, what on, I like David. to do in that case is I, I usually check on a different social media network if they have another profile as well. Right. And, and reverse image search their profile picture. Yeah. So that can quickly tell you whether that's a stock photo that they stole off the internet, or if they do have other, uh, uh, social media profiles, they tend to use the same profile picture. Yeah. So it can quickly lead you to a Twitter, Instagram, or something else. Yeah. So. All right. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, we'll stay with the hat trick for Stanley. And thank you, everyone else, for your participation. Um, and uh, yeah, really quick, I like to show what's coming up. No show next week. Um, it's Thanksgiving in the States. I'm also involved in a, in a company networking event, so I won't be around um, to do a live broadcast. But on December 6th, I have uh, Matt Christensen coming on, and I'm really looking forward to the Fraud Not Frog uh, talk that we're going to have. So be sure to mark that on the calendar, December 6th at 10 a.m. Um, yeah. Thanks again, Joe, for your time.
David, thank you. This is a, a great venture of yours. Love it. And uh, I, I've loved seeing my colleagues ahead of me come on, even Dr. Fraud yeah. uh, as, as, your, as your first. So yeah, um, yeah keep Perfect. up the good work. Yeah, thank you. And we'll be in touch. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Bye-bye.